Let's go to it. The creative world of Mark Howard. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing pretty good. I'm joining you from uh, up here in Topanga Canyon with all the hippies. The, the canyon, the historic canyon. Got your book yep. right here. Loving cool. it. Thank you. Did you grow up in California? Uh, I've lived here for probably about 30 years. I grew up in Canada, but I'm born in Manchester, England. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so I did my kind of high school years in Canada. My parents immigrated there. And then uh, as of like 20, I kind of moved uh, down to uh, to New Orleans uh, to receive my uh, what I call my rhythmic education. <laughs> love it. Love it. So uh, many, so many great people in the recording industry from Canada. I, I don't know if you know Bill Kennedy or Garth Richardson, two guys I knew that were from there. It just yeah, yeah, like... yeah. Yeah, they're cool kids. So, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, Neil came from Canada and so did Joni and, you know. And so I've got to work with them over the years too. So it's a, it's a good kind of homecoming. <laughs> yeah. The, the book is so beautiful. Um, it, it, The pictures don't feel invasive or they feel so warm. And I love how summer black and white, and yeah. summer color. It just makes so much sense. I mean, I know I'm dro just dropping in, but these are records like time out of mind that are just life changing. The, the pictures feel like the record It's really warm. The book's yeah, really yeah. warm. <laughs> Tried to capture that that uh, feel for each kind of uh, place, you know, like there's a place called the Paramore here in uh, L.A., which is like a big, huge movie star estate. And it was uh, really beautiful, ornate, and and it just needed to be in color. Yeah. But, but like with Dylan's thing, it had to be smoky and dark and black and white and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, so we kind of like... Uh, Tried to make it feel like the places that where I recorded all these records, and and they feel um you so you were ta I was trying to look for a photo credit. Did you take all these photos? Or is this um, a lot of them are what's called time lapse photography. In the studio, it's really harder to ask. You know, can I have a photo taken with you? Or they don't feel like that either. Yeah, no, nothing they're, feels like that. But they're time lapse photography. I just put my camera either on a speaker or on a table or beside me or whatever. And it just takes a photo every 30 seconds. So I'm able to capture these people in their natural habitat. It's kind of like a wild kingdom, you know, going in there to capture the animals in their natural habitat. But uh, yeah, so like those beautiful pictures of Neil were, you know, like they're like, you can just feel like, you know, like he's singing and he's letting it out. And so it's really beautiful. Like Yeah, like you say, and they're also like, a lot of them are smoky when they're meant to. I love how the smoky ones feel smoky and it's just right. It just doesn't feel like an obviously iPhones. I don't think at the time of some of these. Were no, smoky. no, it's, it's too stark and bleak in the way the iPhone look, you know, so. Yeah. But, but I think there is a couple of iPhone pictures in there, like the ones from Jamaica and stuff. But those even, it's funny that, that some of the Malibu ones and the lesser known artists, it feels very 70s. You feel like you're looking at Bob Marley pictures. It, it feels, yeah. you know, yeah. just. Yeah. With, it's, it's, well, I've always been infatuated with, with photography. And, uh, you know, for me to put out a, a photo book has always been a dream of mine. So, and so collecting, you know, I've just got like so many photos. It was really hard to pick, you know, my favorites because I'm attached to all of them. So the people at ECW that put it out, uh, Book Press, um, they uh, they helped me kind of like um, kind of get down to like maybe 200 photos where I had like 500. You know, it's like it was it was for me, it's exciting. But for maybe other people, it's like they get might get bored of, you know, looking at a picture of a can on a counter or something. You know, like, but, it, but it, yeah, but it, but it, it flows because there's enough of like you could have did a whole bit book on time out of mind. Oh, yeah. Easy. If you have an artist you might not know, but you find something and you look at, like you say, a can in the background. All the, you're really in it, in yeah. these environments. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it definitely um, uh, I captured vi the vibe of what was going on, especially that, that I think that was the most important thing. You know, it's it's great to look back on them and it just transports you right back into that room. And there you are with whoever it was, you know. And you talk about the environments influencing the sound of these records, you, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that was a big thing. Because, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, so a lot of the I prefer a lot of places like with really high ceilings, like the Paramore was a studio. Uh, it was a house here in Hollywood that was an old movie star estate. 
but in the twenties they would they had built this kind of like big huge salon to have opera singers come over to do private recitals for you when you're rich, and so that that the Paramore uh, estate was one of those. Uh, was owned by uh, Antonio Marino, who was the first Latin lover of the screen, and he married uh, Daisy Canfield, who was the oil tycoon uh, family that discovered oil here in L.A. And uh, her father built her uh, a 22 room mansion right at the top of Mitchell Trina in Silver Lake. And it's on four and a half acres. It's secluded and it's really an incredible, incredible place. And I I walked into it accidentally and and ended up making a whole bunch of records there with like Lucinda and Tom Waits. And uh, yeah, it just became really a, a cool uh, hangout. And at one point I would invited uh, Sarah McLaughlin and her producer, uh, Pierre Machant, to come and uh, work in one of the wings on the house. And on the other wing, I had invited uh, Fiona Apple to come in uh, so that she could work on her record. And meanwhile, I'm working in the big ballroom with Lucinda Williams. And so Sarah would get up at 8 a.m. and work till noon. And then uh, I would start at noon and work till uh, 11. And then Fiona Apple would work from like midnight till 7 a.m. So it was like nobody saw each other and everybody had the seclusion of the whole house and it was it was pretty incredible to have so much going on musically and nobody could ever saw each other amazing because yeah. the, there it's weird because as a kid i remember do- thinking that recording studios felt like doctor's offices you have magazines yeah. oh, you sit, yeah. even a and m you'd just be sitting there like this, yeah. this, something about a doctor's office vibe in every studio i went to as a kid yeah so it's, they're horrible and I can't stand working in that environment because the of communication, you know, for me to like talk to somebody that's out on the floor, it's in a glass booth. They don't got their headphones on and I need them to, you know, play a different part or whatever, you know, it's just, you just get frustrated by uh, communication loss, you know, where I work in one big room with all my gear and, and I, I have the speakers on loud, like it's a show and it just becomes like people don't wear headphones and like it's a, the people sing more in tune without headphones and it's a more of a an environment you know yes and, but that's because i work with real musicians and bands and stuff like that where more modern records aren't made that way you know they're made on a laptop and in somebody's bedroom and, and it's all loops and samples and so um it's a it's a completely opposite you know i go for performances from people and have you know a feel from from that take and stuff like that so yeah so that's my main kind of way i work so it's been pretty interesting yeah because even now i think so much music is made sitting down where people used to stand up yeah you you know what i mean like there's a different aesthetic to standing up and and sitting down is cool too if you've been you know that's your vibe but yeah well it's long hours you gotta sit down so but um but yeah yeah it's there's nothing like having uh, you know, be able to stand up. Um, I had a studio in Oxnard, California called Teatro. the Teatro. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where I made Willie Nelson's Teatro record. Yeah. And so I'd work with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and you two there. And so I had like a big um, uh, sound system for playbacks, you know, with like 18 inch subwoofers and then, you know, uh, Westlake audio tops and stuff like that. So I built my studios like a live show, kind of like a, like the way that I picked, you know, because when I do a playback, I want it to be larger than life. And then I had a rear PA, a stacked uh, a PA from Holland, these like cubes and like two 18s and tops. And so when I do like overdubs, I pipe it out of there and people can do their guitar solo stuff and it feels like you're live. And, you know, it's like it's where when you have headphones on and you're in a glass booth and you know like how can you be inspired you know it's like it's it's yeah it's a it's a different method so yeah and and i was thinking you have such beautiful atmospheres there had to be some times where it distracted the art because i know some people that would have just been swimming all day and doing everything to avoid (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. because you know a lot of times you want to avoid the task at hand especially when it comes to writing and creating did that ever happen with such amazing atmospheres uh well i uh it was a funny story uh from the teatro where i had um i i had uh, the pro- uh, the projector room the projector was gone so i got like six 60 millimeter projectors and the screen was still there 
so I could project like movies and overlap them on the screen and stuff like that. And, and then I had like an oil wheel that would just kind of like drip and, you know, and, uh, you know, so I usually uh, had the oil wheel on because it was very kind of psychedelic, right? And then uh, working with Bob Dylan on Time Out of Mind there, and Bob just suddenly one day he goes, I like that one. It was just of the oil wheel dripping. It's like, well, it's not a painting. It's just like happening. You know, so I thought, thought it was pretty funny that he picked that out of nowhere. That's know? amazing. Yeah. And uh, I like in the book where in New Orleans, you were taking him for motorcycle rides. Yeah to uh get ready for the day can you talk about that that was well he saw that i had a, a couple of harleys in the courtyard of the house we were recording at and he just walked up to me one day when he came in and he goes hey mark can you, you get me one of those bikes and i said yeah for sure and so i got my friend in florida and st petersburg to send me some polaroids of a couple of bikes that he had some vintage harleys and so those he had a beautiful one it was kind of like uh um it was a 1966 uh, Harley Davidson electric glide and it was electric blue. It was like a beautiful one. Wow. So he picked that out of the pile of photos. He goes, I want that one. And so I said, all right, uh, we weren't working on weekends. So I said, I'll go on the weekend and pick it up for it. He says, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll get Victor to get you the money and, and you go, go, go get it for me. And so I did. And so I came back and then uh, like on the Monday, our first day back, he came in a little earlier than, Usually work could come in around four, but I think he came in around two or something just to see the bike and and, and check it out, right? And so yeah, so uh, he just fell in love with it. It was an incredible bike, and uh, and so I said, look, I'll, I'll show you how to get a, around here. And so I would take him down to the levee, and we'd ride along the the Mississippi along the levee, and that would kind of go down, and we go out into the uh, um, uh, uh, the area with the uh, what do you call it? um big huge mansions and stuff like that and then there's like a huge kind of like um trees that overlap and it's like driving through a tunnel and so you know antebellum mansions like you know big huge columns and stuff like that so uh yeah so i showed him these places to, to take rides and so he ended up taking these rides by himself after i'd shown him where to go and then he'd come back on, on a, one day and he goes the police are really friendly around here I said, yeah, sure they are. You're not wearing a helmet. And there's a helmet law here. It's not like California where there's no helmet law. They're all waving at you to, like, put a helmet on. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then another time, he, I heard him start the bike uh, outside the gate. And uh, I had it all there ready for him to take a ride. And I heard him take off. And I heard him stall around the corner. And I ran around the corner and to see what, what happened. And uh, he's sitting on the bike like this, looking straight ahead. There's like three people in front of him. Hey, Bob, can we get your autograph? Like, And he just sat there like if they weren't even there. And I ran up to them and I said, hey, leave this guy alone. And uh, he forgot to put his petcock on for the gas. You know, it's like a little yeah. thing that you turn to, to make the gas flow. So he ran out of yeah. gas. So I turned it back on, fired it back off, and off he went. So it was like a, it was kind of a strange thing, but it was funny. There's, and that's amazing. There's there's a big motorcycle theme in the book. And I love where Neil Young tells you, after 50, don't do cocaine or ride motorcycles. Yeah, he's lost all of his friends to motorcycle deaths and cocaine. <laughs> so Wow. Yeah, so so uh, he's right. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, I, yeah. I ride, but I ride, you know, like in the countryside or somewhere where it's like, I won't go into a city on a bike. It's just people are too involved with their cell phones and just would, you'll get killed instantly in a city. Yeah, I agree. I would love, I grew up riding motorcycle dirt bikes and I just, I just yeah, know yeah, I'd be dead in a right. week. And, you yeah, know, exactly. Man, that time out of mine, it, it just, I think w my favorite record of all time, I, I had my first huge breakup when I was 29 and that record just pulled me through. One of the darkest, swampiest, cool. I just, <laughs> I just bought the 10 records, you know, the, the new, oh, the yeah. new you yeah. know, and it's, uh, those pictures feel like it that's what i really liked about your pictures is they they really feel like that record yeah yeah it, it definitely you know uh i i think there's there's a couple of shots that are made from um uh, uh what's called video print uh while we were uh, in miami um daniel Blamois' brother bob Blamois came in to film the the session and stuff like that so he's he got some of those and he made like some little kind of like prints, uh, photo prints from it. 
he had a little printer that does video prints. And so there's a couple of shots like me and Bob and we're just, it's very grainy and kind of like funny looking, but it, it captured, it's like a ghost, you know, you're capturing this, 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 this instant, you know, like at the time. And on uh, Oh Mercy, Bob didn't want us to take any photos of him. Okay. It's like oh, taking photos, like stop in time. I don't want any photos. Like it's like, wow, to stop in time. So, but I sneaked out a couple of uh, shots of the bike and him at the counter writing his lyrics and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So in those days, I used to use a Polaroid camera to take snapshots of the console to know where uh, my panning yeah. is and what effects I had on everything and stuff like that. So I could easily go back to it because the those consoles weren't automated or anything like that in those days. So uh, you had to like document every knob turn and where everything landed. So photos were the easiest than writing it down. Yeah. Wow. I, I Okay. That makes sense. And that's how the camera comes in because there's just so many clues. It feels like a mystery in this and it still stays <laughs> It still stays mysterious, like rock and roll. You know, I mean, I mean, to me, you're essentially taking pictures of Shakespeare. You're riding motorcycles with Shakespeare. You know, I mean, basically, <laughs> you know, it's it's just yeah. insane. But creating these environments and, and they're all so different. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, some are modern and some are, you know, old. Like Kingsway was an old, uh, uh, beautiful old house in the French Quarter. It was a, um, uh, a woman... Uh, a baroness and her father was a count and so she she had this kind of like a beautiful kind of a, a villa right in the mid middle of the french quarter it was the biggest family dwelling in the french quarter and so she would have like you know bonnet parades and all these like you know she was she would go through men eating you know eat them up and spit them out kind of you know she was like one of those wild women and uh, so she ended up, everybody you know, died and the house sat empty for years and uh, just walking by it. I thought that would be an interesting place to make a record and, you know, and told Dan about it and he said, well, and then I went and saw it and then I told him, no, it's too far gone. The whole ceiling's collapsed. The, all the rugs are just rotted. And, and uh, but he, he saw something in it that he wanted to buy it. And so he bought it for like $200,000, which is, dirt cheap really you know for what yeah. it was so probably worth five million now so yeah but, but yeah so um you know uh so he bought it i did a cleanup but i brought in this uh friend of mine jimmy mack who ran the uh jazz fest uh um cruise like to for setups and stuff like that and so within one month jimmy and uh kind of tore the place apart and ripped all the you know uh, rugs out of there and uh, painted it and it was it was livable after that and so we I moved in and set up a studio and I went to New York to um, buy a, a console from uh, this uh, equipment broker Dan Alexander he had this API console up for sale and so he called Dan and said you know if you want this console come get it you know so it was at um, the record plant in uh, in New York, and I had to go get it out. The day before I went to go get it, I got chicken pox. And I woke up in the middle of the night and went in the mirror. It was like, my whole face is like full of like spots and stuff like that. And so I had to get on a plane the next day, fly to New York, dismantle this console, and bring it back down to New Orleans. And so I got there. Nobody would come around me because I had chicken pox. So I had to do it all by myself. Oh, yeah. And so I had to take each module, wrap it in in uh, bubble wrap and put a number on it. And so I knew where to put it back. And, and then the, all the wires just went into the wall and, you know, like I couldn't disconnect those. So I just went and bought a Sawzall. I soldered it through all the wires. I, who knows where they went to, but you couldn't take them out of the wall. So, and then uh, they had built the console inside the room. So it was like to, for me to get it out, I had to take all the, con all the modules out of it and we had to stand it up on its end and then jimmy it out this door to get it out like a piano kind of thing and so we we actually got it out of there where they had built it inside of there i didn't think it was going to come out oh, but it, cool. yeah it was the uh, original uh, api console that uh, jimmy hendrix did electric ladyland on his studio wasn't finished uh, at the time that he put that record out so he did it all there at the record plant oh, okay yeah wow that's amazing they uh and and um and you, two of the pictures that blew my mind was there's two pages and it's you and Joni Mitchell in a drum set in a living room. 
Oh yeah, it's Brian Blade and uh, and Joni. She's ch- chain smoking. She won't leave her house, so I had to bring my studio to her house and set it up. And she'd asked me uh, to remix her first record, um, songs of a seagull or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, so she said uh, David Crosby had had uh, produced it, and then she says, "Well, he he didn't produce it. He misproduced it." And it's Joni playing acoustic by herself, and he got her to double it, yeah. her guitar part. She hated that. All those years, she sat with it all those years and hated it until she asked me to remix it just back to the, the way it should be, just her and her vocal, just without the, the single guitar. So, yeah, so that was interesting. She tells story, all kinds of crazy stories, and and uh, it's 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 pretty <laughs> – it was a, a pretty uh, – uh, educational uh, I'm sure recordings, yeah and brian blade he's a uh, a kid from new orleans kind of a jazz drummer he is a jazz drummer he's got a couple of his own records out and so she loves brian and so he i got him to come up to play on a couple of songs that never had drums on uh over over the time so um so oh, yeah that's cool yeah yeah uh, i think it was one called strange boy or something like that we just had congas on it or something like that and so I got Brian to play a nice little kind of jazz part on it. So it was cool. So so you're always kind of thrust into unconventional situations, making something work that there's not a template. It's not like you show up at A&M every day, get the Newman no. out of the club. I'm a gorilla recorder. I go in there and like I bring my gear, set it up. And, you know, I don't get sounds at all. I don't like spend hours getting drums on. I just record them the way they are in the room. And that's the sound. And I'll make it sound better later on, but I got to get the performance down first and not wear out the musician. You know, like you don't want to have Joni or sitting around while I go do, do, do for like 10 hours trying to find out why the kick drum don't sound good. Um, you know, so it's a, uh, and the way I, there's something to, to do with um, recording all in the same room and listening to it back in the same room where in a, in a normal studio, you got to, Go out on the floor, behind the glass window, play the part, come in through another door, come into the control room, listen to it. And you're like, why doesn't it sound as good as it does out on the floor? And yeah. like you're playing in a different controlled environment that's dead. And then out there on the floor it might be a little more live or just just sound different. You know, like you think you're getting a good sound out there, but you get in the control room and it just sounds like, you know, you're hitting a wet fish against a piece of table on the table or, you know, so... But when you do it all in the room, it's like it comes back sounding better than what you heard. So uh, it's a mystery for that kind of recording. And I don't use any isolation or any, you know, I'll isolate guitar amps in separate rooms and bathrooms and have everybody play in a circle or a, ha- or a horseshoe or whatever. And just uh, it, it communication with the band is uh, essential because they can look at each other and they can talk to each other. And they go, oh, no, let's try this, uh, try four more beats in the front of the chorus, and then we'll drop in, and, you know, just easy. But, you know, when their headphones are on, they have to have a mic, and and it just becomes, you know, uh, a, a nightmare, you know, for me anyways. So, yeah, I get it. I, I always love those early L.A. woman photos of the Doors. They were one of the only bands you saw making a record at that place on La Siena, you know, I mean, it's a Mexican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That- and then there was another place, uh, what was it called? It was in Malibu, and the band worked there, and uh, Shangri La or something. And Rick Rubin, that was an old, yeah. Rick's got that house now, but it was like you know, crazy house, big glass wind, uh, glass, um, sorry, big mirror, you know, with Shangri La in front of the bar and a real cocaine kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny what you said. Someone I knew that was part of the Doors, someone older, said that part of Jim Morrison's alcoholism. No one wanted to say was really to do with him waiting for them to get sounds. If they just, oh, sure. yeah. if they just yeah. would have called him and said, "Come sing," yeah, that sloppiness was him waiting in the control room with his schlitz. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he, I I treat it like uh, it's a uh, this is a show, and they're walking in, and you got to be in record while they play, and you know, on they go, and the, they don't have to think about anything technical or you know, like. Uh, and then headphones is just a whole other mess of thing. Like, okay, I can't hear anything here. Or you bring up the kick drum or I can't hear the click or, you know, like all that stuff that is just like you spend hours trying to get a headphone mix where you could be playing the song in the room and hearing everybody. And, and you know, just uh, it's it's a completely 
you know, way to do it. That I, 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 it's the only way I know how to do it. What was I've the first heard, time that you did this? Yeah. And what was the first real breakthrough where you're like, this is the way I'm going to set up my career? I, you know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing as a kid, but I, I've been doing this since like 14, 15 years old. I took over my parents' basement took the ping pong table, made that into a, a drum riser and had couches and posters and, you know, we do acid and do yeah, yeah. crazy stuff, you know? And now when I look back at it, it's like, I've been doing this as a, from a kid, you know, like, you know, finding cool, you know, making a, uh, uh, kind of a nice place to hang out, you know, kind of, and make it comfortable for everybody. And, you know, so. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause wow. you, you know, a gear can be very intimidating in a way of you walk into a studio and there's a big, huge SSL console. It's like 20 feet long. And you're like all these buttons and lights and, you know, like well, that kind of makes you dizzy, you know, or, you know, just kind of for a musician, you know, they can't comprehend what all that shit does. They, they have no clue, but you know, it's like a stereo. The way I look at it is like, you know, you got a volume, you got a bass and a treble and that's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and so how did the book come about? Because it's such a beautiful book, man. I, I love okay. this book. Yeah. So I put out a book about a uh, a year and a half ago, or maybe it's two years now, called Listen Up. And it's all the stories behind the, the, the scene of all of these records. So, you know, I tell the stories of how, you know, how when Bob Dylan came in to make the uh, Oh Mercy record. And then, you know, and then, you know, 10 years later, we made uh, um, the next um time out of mind record and so there's a, no, the recording part is really the boring part of making records is yeah. the shit that happens while you're doing it and the the drama and all this crazy stuff that happens and, you know like you know just and so that's the the stories are all in there and you know and you hear all the rock and roll stories from Fleetwood Mac and all that stuff everybody's angry everybody's mad and there's fights and you know but you know there's there's crazier stories you know there's so many insects in, in my book from, you know, being in Australia and we're, you know, recording and there's a big, huge huntsman spider on the wall. And, and then I, we go to eat, get something to eat and we're driving over like snakes that, you know, pythons going across the road and, you know, funnel web spiders that lived in the toilet and, you know, you had to be careful. <laughs> so all kinds of crazy uh, uh, stuff happens. And in Mexico, you know, scorpions. And so there's a lot of, uh, a yeah. lot of, but, uh, you know, crazy stuff that happens uh, because you're in these crazy locations, you know, around the world. Uh, and you wouldn't get that in a studio. <laughs> no. True. Maybe you would. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So so that was that. But but what led to the um the photos? So then you just just were like, I'm just, just going to put the photos out, which I love. Um, well, after I wrote uh, Listen Up, um, it, it did real well. And. You know, I got it in every library across America, and and then uh, and there's a Spanish version of it that uh, people in Spain uh, did the license on it. So there's a Spanish version of it now, too, which is exciting. And then uh, you know, I've just had all these photos, and there's only like little photos inside the the written book about all the stories. But I thought, well, people don't like to read, you know. But they like to look at pictures, and I like to read. But I like that this is a break. Like I, I, you yeah. know, you, you can go back and read and just like take it all in. Like, that's that's Tom Waits. That's how he sings. I, I never knew that. You know, like because Tom, you know, he he he's got a big voice. You know, it's a real barrel. And so when he sings, he feels like his voice gets lost. So he, he cops it. It's really clear now, but you can't hear me now hear me now you know like those yeah. kind of crazy so he's always cupping his, his voice to kind of make it like this kind of like clearer thing for him and so i i bought this uh rca microphone 40 uh rca 44 it's like like the um same one that um uh uh not ray charles um uh billy holiday and a bunch of big stars um from capitol buildings would always use these these type of microphones so i got one of those for his his voice and i made the most beautiful vocal sound i ever made and he said well can you take the bottom off of it and you know sounded a little bit like murray mclaughlin and i'm like murray mclaughlin no it's the worst guy stab me in the heart oh my god <laughs> so, but yeah so it's it was you know so there's these all these stories about you know you know 
stuff that goes on in studios. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's exciting. You know? And it's, you know, it's like me traveling around the world and making records with all these people and, you know, going to Berlin and working in this like place called the DDR building that Hitler had built to uh, do uh, pro- uh, radio propaganda. And so he would have orchestras playing live to the radio. And so he built this huge room and I ended up going in there with this band from Norway, Kaiser's Orchestra, and made a beautiful record for them in this big, huge, you know, as big as a New York City block type of building. The room, instead, it's in the book. You'll see it. Yes. Yeah. Really, oh, yeah, yeah, it's in there. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, how was Iggy Pop? What, was that a very physical recording? Did you? He seems like um, a physical guy that if you give him the room to not do this... That, yeah, he seems made for your method. Yeah, oh, he is, and you know, we became really good friends, and he's one of my favorite guys that have worked that I work with, and so yeah, so he would you know just lay on the floor and do his vocals laying on the floor, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and you'll see photos of him, yeah, you know, everybody in the band laying on the floor playing, you know, so it's uh, so it's you know the freedom of of all that kind of stuff. You don't have to have you know you know you don't have a headphone and wire attached to you. And, yeah. So, yeah, so he had uh, he brought his Siamese cat and his cat uh, his cat's name was Mookie. And his, he brought his wife, too. And her, her name was Sushi, Sushi, uh, Suki, Suki. I think it was Suki. So I would always get, I'd always get them mixed up. I would say, hey, Suki. Hey, Mookie. <laughs> like, <I'm> like, wow. <laughs> Someone said once that Iggy Pop is a smart guy that acts dumb and david bowie's a dumb guy that acts smart i know that's sacrilegious that i said it but someone well uh, uh, iggy's very intellectual definitely yeah yeah and uh you know he's he's i i i you know he's known as like the godfather of punk and all that stuff but i i think he should be up there recognized like with dylan and uh, everybody else that's an amazing writer because he would do three takes in a row and he's got nothing written down and he'll rhyme do rhymes uh, just as good as the last take that we did, but completely different. And so it's hard to, oh, I like the rhyme from that one, but I like that one too. And it's like, it's hard to think. And he's just, it's all off the cuff, you know, he's just like coming out with all this stuff. Is it, is, fe- yeah, is it fearful? You say Dylan's writing the lyrics there. Is that a little fearful, like with Iggy and him, that you're not coming in with finished songs? You're kind of doing it here. Something's got to occur. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, off the cuff. And say, same with Dylan. He works the same way. He never, like time out, time out of mind, he never had any lyrics, sheets, or written down. And I would write the first word and last word of each uh, of the verses and courses and whatever. And then I'd fill it in every time we'd listen, you know, bang. And then, uh, so he would always come over and say, hey, Mark, can I look at the book? And so he, he'd go through them the, where I've written all of his lyrics. He's oh, okay, all right. I, I forgot I said that. Okay, so it's like, it's just a, a little... You know, he he's we became like this kind of like cool little team, you know, with the songs. <laughs> Amazing! I just got the 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 a box set, and um, you hear "Love Sick" just starts as like a strummy song before it becomes mm-hmm. this song. I'm like, wow, that the studio really did shape that. And yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be the same song when it's just strum. Like, wow, that yeah. had to be something to hear something like that take place. Yeah. So that song "Love Sick," um, uh. You know, the, the, it was in Miami and it was like I was working in a studio that's got a glass window and everybody's out on the floor. And uh, so when so while I'm recording, I'm thinking, you know, I got to play this back when the guys come in and I got to make it sound exciting for them to, you know, so that they can, you know, uh, work off of it. And so I dialed up this flanger that I put on Bob's voice and then, you know, and put a del- this kind of like uh, Elvis slap on it and, and then kind of like did to some other kind of reverb things on the drums and stuff to make them sound really in the distance and stuff like that and uh, so they came in and they heard it and so as i'm as they're listening i'm doing a mix a live mix right there bang as the, as they're listening back and i print it to a dat machine and uh that song lovesick that's the mix from the playback of of them recording it and so because it had all those strange effects on it and stuff like yeah. that it was it became like this whole kind of I could never better it, you know. It was oh, it's so beautiful with the, the and uh did you feel like there were ghosts there? I remember when he won, I think it was the Grammy, he talked about ghosts of Buddy Holly and everything. Being yeah, yeah, there yeah. With you. So I, I think he was having some kind of connection, you know, definitely some kind of thing. But I'm not sure if Buddy Holly actually recorded in that studio, but you know, it was legendary for yeah, you know. but you feel ghosty in those pictures. Yeah, it feels yeah, yeah, if, yeah, you yeah. know, 
Well, the it was fourteen people playing at the same time, and it it was it became you know a problem because Bob every take he changes the key, and Bob can change the key and just play the song and not have to think about it. But for a musician to change a key, it's like relearning the song. Yeah, like a piano. Yeah, like yeah, it's uh, just like everything's in different places now because it's a different key, right? And so they come back in, and we listen to a take and. And Lanwa flips out like uh, he said, you know, if you don't know what what to play, don't play it, you know, and because it would come back like ah, everybody's making mistakes at the top of each verse and chorus. And it just and Lanwa goes, it sounds so junky. And then Jim Keltner, the drummer, he goes, is that East Coast junky or West Coast junky? Amazing. <laughs> he was a junkie. <laughs> you know, so, oh, my God. So, and so, yeah, there's two different types of junkies from the East Coast and West Coast and and especially musicians, you know, but, you know, it's uh, it was completely different type of scene for sure. But, but See, yeah, you probably dealt with so much psychology. There's even bits of it in here. I love this. The little bits of text that bring you into the this, the text is needed the, at the beginning of the chapters where you describe how it went down. And yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll have a studio than everybody that recorded there. I really enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's just just a little snippet. So just kind of give you a flavor of. Of what happened in those uh, places, and so, but the pictures take over, and it's, they do. This yeah. it's such a a beautiful void. You know, that's a trip around the world that we're just looking at that book. You know, so it's, it's cool. It, it's magic, man. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for your time. It's a beautiful book, and uh, I'm going to put links to it so everybody can grab it. Great, and, and uh, please say goodbye to everybody. And um, I'll I'll say goodbye, hang out so I can say goodbye after you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>